Okay. So, um, Matt Gordon's not here, but this is the first thing that pops up if you search for stages. <laughs> um, and that is what my talk is about. Uh, it's a gem that we wrote. Basically, the, the problem we're trying to solve is we chew up a lot of data, um, enough data that problems where you look at, it, at the data set and, and what you're trying to extract from it and say, oh, well, you know, I can write a SQL query, that. It'll take me 20 seconds and I'll be done. But the data is too big and it's, you, you can't take it in the form that it's in and then write it to a database and then do your query. It's a data stream that you have to manipulate and it's hard. Um, we have an existing solution that was written poorly by really smart people. Um, and those are the worst kind of solutions because very quickly, nobody can understand it, including the person who wrote it. It just spins out of control. So the, the goal with this was to be able to process streams of data and to be able to break down what we're processing into little tiny units that anyone can pick one of these things up and it'll be pretty clear what it's doing so that they can fix it when it breaks or make a new one, yes. I was just wondering like, an example of a stream of data. So, boy, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if you wait, he'll show you a stream. Say, like you know, fire hose sure. Fire hose. Say, say you're getting um, the stock market, okay. a stock ticker feed. Or um, say you're getting, say, user behavior on a website. I don't know who would do that. But, um, or say you just have a really enormous file that just won't fit in memory. Um, we have data sets that, that just EC2 doesn't offer a server that's big enough. Um, so anytime where the data set is such that you would prefer to deal with it as a stream, whether it is or not. Um, yeah, so the idea is we want something that we can break down into those pieces that can be easy to, to digest, um, but that can still get the job done. So, so, wow, that is just too big. And it's going over to the right. That's good enough. Um, so this is the project. Uh, it's called Donkle Fund. And we're going to analyze the uh, congressional record of the 112th Congress. So their approval rating is like 10%. Is there anyone in that 10% here? Because <laughs> this talk gets kind of brutal <laughs> to them. Um, so, oh, and we got a little bouncing thing over here for my mail. That's good. Let's just go. No, get out of here. Okay. Um, so this is just a little script that uses stages. Um, normal bundler stuff up there. Um, stages sugar is, gives you kind of the nice names for all of the little pipelines. Um, there's also the, the raw form of it that we'll look at in a second, but sugar is usually the thing you want to use. Um, so I've set up a pipeline here using stages um, that's just going to emit this people.xml, which I know is the name of a file I have, and then it's got this file line stage. And when we run that, some things are going to happen. So uh, people XML looks like this. That is all the members of the 112th Congress. And the structure of this thing is awesome. Uh, <laughs> there's exactly one role for every person. Everything's an attribute. It's, <coughs> it's XML. Um, what do you want? So. I'm going to omit that and then pass it into this uh, file line stage that I've set up. So let's take a look at that. Um, stages fundamentally, almost every stage that you write uses handle value. Um, what handle value does, it says I'm going to take, I'm going to get one value from whatever's passed in and then do something with it. And then somewhere in handle value, um, you're going to call into this output function. <coughs> Um, that's it, that's the whole thing. All the magic is hidden there. So in this case, it assumes it gets a file name, it opens it, it reads the lines. This is really stupid Ruby code. But that's the point is that you can break, hopefully you can break your problem down into lots of stupid Ruby code. Um, so if I run this thing, if I run this thing, um, we'll get, you know, it counts the lines. Oh, and hey, I put this note in here for myself. So this whole thing's already up on GitHub, if you want to look at it. Um, yeah, so there it's reading the top of the, the people file. It's counting lines. Um, this is very boring. So I can see you getting bored. 
So in this, in this case, handle value is taking in the entire XML file? Uh, handle value is taking in the file name. Okay. And then right, it is right, right. opening sure. the file and outputting the lines of the file right. to the next stage, which uh, in this case, the next stage is nothing. So we're just um, you know, <coughs> outputting it to, to the console. So uh, let's say we want to read a directory. Uh, in this case, I'm still emitting a string. I've got another stage that'll read the directory here. Let's take a look at it. Um, again, handle value, it reads some values, it calls output. This is very boring. I'm already bored. Um, yeah, I mentioned sugar was the nice way to get at these. So here I just define this files and directory as a sort of give me a new stage every time that looks like this. Um, recycling stages is is bad. They kind of are bound to the pipeline you put them in the first time, and I'll get to that in a second. But this is what that sugar module does for you. So let's take a look at, oh, I didn't actually run that one. Um, so I run this, you'll see there's all uh, 1,329 votes that the 112th Congress has had. Um, you'd think they would have done something more with those. <laughs> So I want a file that will, uh, a stage that will actually do something. Um, so I've got, I wrote this parse person stage. Um, and I'll run it. So this will spit out the, the XML kind of broken down into a hash. Um, but there are some things that I can do if I want to get a useful structure out of that. I put it. Wow, really? Um, so in this case, I'm using uh, REXML, which is a stream parser for XML, and doing very boring stuff. Um, you know, if it's a person, go get it, grab that, grab that roll node. I said it's one to one. Just merge it in there, and then spit out an, an open struct. This is just as boring as all the previous examples. Um, which one was that, three? So this one it gets more interesting. Um, so let's use this structure that we've created um, and do something with it. So I've got this pipeline here. Um, it'll grab that XML, turn it into people, and then I'm just going to throw that into a hash by ID, um, the thing that joins these files together. Um, the files for votes look like this. Again, nice, beautiful XML that we all like that now they're using tags for their attributes. I don't know if they were written by two different groups of people or what. Um, but I'm going to create this reps hash, which trust me, it's just a hash that does ID to people. And then I'm going to create this big complicated mess. But it's a mess built out of little pieces. So I'm going to get their directory. Um, look at the files. We've got this select stage that says just give me the XML files. I don't want anything else that's in there. Um, this map stage works just like map. It'll take the output of that. It'll slap the directory name on it so I actually go and look at the right thing. Um, I've got this parse votes stage which parses votes. Um, and let's go look at that real quick. So parse votes, um, I'm just XML simple, grab that vote structure, turn it into a hash, and output it to the next stage. Um, so now what, what we're emitting at this point is going to be a stream of those vote objects. Um, but now I'd like to sort of group those together. So this wrap stage will um, sort of push you into the context of each vote. Um, and then you'll see what comes out of it. Um, so within each vote, I'm going to go and grab the voter. Um, it comes back as an array because of the way XML simple works. So for each voter in there, um, I want to go look up in that reps hash and find that voter's party. Um, and then this group stage will just kind of throw those into a key to the count of the occurrences of that key hash. It's, it's group by. Um, you tell the wrap function, hey, I'm, I'm aggregating here. So this little sub pipeline will take that vote 
and reference it against your other table and convert it into hopefully some useful data. And what comes out of wrap is going to be the original value as a key and then everything that came out of wrap as, as the value um, in a hash. So this map just goes in and say, okay, give me the first thing, pull the question value out of there because that's the interesting part of the vote um, and it's give me the first thing in there. So I'll run this, which will make a lot more sense than talking about it. I already did. Um, so in this case, um, you can see the votes here, um, which is the key that it pulled out, and then it's referring to a hash that's the values that came out of that wrap stage. So you can see um, the number of people just who voted from each party on these laws. So um, the job-killing health care law, um, they all voted on. This isn't really interesting though. We need to get a little deeper into the data before interesting things happen. But I'll stop here to make sure everybody's still on board with me finishing the talk. If, so if you're kind of lost, think if you're a Unix command line guy, pipe works like pipe on the command line. You like got stuff and you're gonna pipe it into the next thing. Yeah. So you got process one that does really small, simple things and it's gonna just pass some crap to the next stage. And um, it does some other cool things under the hood to enable streaming, but really it's just, hey, I like Unix and how pipes work, so let's do that in Ruby. Yeah, basically, it, we, you can explain to anyone how grep works in about 30 seconds, in about a minute, <laughs> five minutes. So the idea was if we could pipe things together like Unix and then have map and select, um, you know, there, a guy did a presentation on building exactly that and then we've just added a bunch more stages to it to make it more useful for us. So let's open up number five, where we get a little deeper into the healthcare law. We're building a nice healthy collection of stages here. So uh, this is that same old I want to build people pipeline uh, we saw last time. Um, and then the pipeline I'm looking at to inspect these votes now is um, again, we're looking at that roles directory, give me all the files. I'm going to pull just the ones that are in the HR 330s because I know that's where all the meat of the healthcare debate is. Um, I'm, I'm a nerd. Um, I got to stick that directory on there and it, that's easy, uh, or parse the votes. The, the real difference is um, it, this pipeline is just, gonna, it, it'll, it'll parse in the votes into um, that structure that we had before. And then I'm just going to pull out the ones where the question is about education. So I guess the script was actually mislabeled and I decided education was more interesting than healthcare. Um, and then this run until exhausted just says, just run the pipeline until there's no more data, put it in an array and give it to me. Um, so we'll make that our education votes pipeline and run that so that we have an array of all the votes on education. Um, then to get the votes, I can the each stage you can pass it an array, or if something comes into the pipeline and handle value, it will just call each on that object. Um, I'm going to do this wrap again where I pull out each voter, and then I've got this count votes stage, which I'll take a look at. Oh, what did I do? So this count votes stage um, knows who your reps are. And it will just go in here and we're using the process function, which handle value is when you want to handle one incoming value. Process is where you want to kind of take over the behavior of the stage, where you need to do your own iteration. Um, but what it does here is it, it will grab that vote object. Uh, it'll go look in reps and pull out the things that we want to vote, the, the, the things we need to know about them. Um, and then it'll spit out um, whatever key value you pass in, I think I'm passing in party in this case, and then which way they voted. Um, and then it just builds a, a cache of which way everybody voted. So it's aggregating those votes by party and, and how they voted. So the other interesting thing about each of the stages here is they only accept, a, they accept a single value at a time. So the first stage might, you know, produce a thousand elements in your array, but each time it, it iterates over each member independently and you get each member of the of the set one at a time. So it, it actually yields back to the one and only gives you one value. 
and you handle that one value, and then it asks for more when it's done. So it's handling one value at a time, not a giant collection of like you know grep. It's here's everything that grep did, and then here's everything that, that you know word count did, and then here's everything from that. This would like handle the first line of the grep would go across, and then the next line, and then the next line. That's why you have to do things like the exhaust values. Yeah. Because normally, the normal behavior is I only want to work on one thing at a time. And yeah. Have you guys gotten around to any parallelization or anything like that at this point? Not yet. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry. It's no. hard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's hard. The uh, underneath the, I'll, I'll talk about how it's implemented later. Um, so count votes is doing aggregation for us, so we can tell wrap. You know what's coming out of here is a hash that's already aggregated, um, and then it'll spit out votes by party. And then down here, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to spit out votes on education by gender, um, just to have something to look at. So I'll run that, and it'll build that representative's hash, and it should pull three values for each one. So in this case, um, whatever the heck that law was. Um, you can see the Republicans were in favor and the Democrats uh, not so much. And we get down here where we're supposed to go by gender and you can see it's still by party. So this is one of those little little gotchas that I mentioned. Um, I've got this cleanup stage, which is uh, just kind of cleaning up the results and, and putting it into a format that's a little easier for me to print out. Uh, the problem is I reused the cleanup stage between pipelines and you can't do that. What you actually have when you build a pipeline in stages is the last element of the pipeline, and that's what you ask for values, and it handles going up the chain. So if you reuse a stage, it still knows where it came from, and that's, that's just really, really bad. Um, so I'll go up here, and we'll make a new cleanup. And now we should have six things, like I said. And yeah, there we go. So you can see... There we are voting on uh, H.R. 1216 to amend the Public Health Service Act, uh, broken down by gender. So pretty easy with a little change to those inner stages to, to change what the thing's processing. So moving on, um, I've got something that prints in a little nicer manner. This is the same education votes pipeline we've seen last time. Um, this. Um, you know, I've got this print title stage that, in another abuse of map, um, all it does is print and then pass its value forward. Um, print votes um, will is a new little sub pipeline where, for each value in votes, it just prints out who voted which way. And I, I put this example in here just to show you know you can have print votes, which is by itself a little pipeline, and you can attach it into another pipeline and it'll, it'll stitch them together the correct way. Um, so if you, when you're breaking down your problem, if you say, okay, here's three stages that are obvious, here's four more stages that are obvious, and then I wanna glue those together, it, it works fine. Um, and there's slightly prettier printing um, of the way the parties voted on our education bills. Keep doing that. Oh, I shouldn't have even put this one in. So instead of wrap, um, you, we've got this restrict resume, which restrict just says I want to kind of collect all the values between now and when I get to resume and then build me a hash out of that. It works just like wrap. Um, it assumes what's coming out as an array, not an aggregated hash, but it's another stage that's in the system um, for you to look at, I guess. Okay. And now we get to the interesting bits. Um, so let's say you're reading from a data stream and the problem is it's an open cursor and you have some stage that takes a long time, in this case just outputting the value, but you have some stage that takes a long time uh, and you can't leave that cursor open while you're calling it. If you're reading from you know, some source over the internet or reading from, in our case, a Mongo database that doesn't like having very long cursors open, um, you need to read all the data and then close that. Um, so if I run this, 
uh, you can see they're plus minus plus minus, which plus is ping and minus is pong. It's constantly, you can see it's pulling a value all the way through the pipeline every time you request more output. Um, but I can fix this. There's a cache stage, which will collect all the values up to that point and then emit them one at a time. So if I run this now, hopefully, you can see it pulls everything and then it processes everything. And this is in here, just so I can show you the way that's implemented. So I'm in the process loop because we're doing, we're, we're doing our own iteration here. And because of the way this is implemented, um, I get my cache, I have to do this construct because you have to call input every time. Input is the function that says to the, the left-hand stage, hey, I need more data. Um, and you just add all of that to the array. Um, and then you do each over that array, and output will pause the execution of this stage while the rest of the pipeline executes. Um, internally, the whole thing's implemented as coroutines. So every time you call output, it pauses execution of that stage until next time you come back. So you can write your functions in a very, in a very dumb way in your stages and know that the concurrency thing is going to get taken care of for you. Now, that's why we don't have it multi-threaded and actually concurrent because we went the other way with coroutines. But it, it means that you can get away with writing stuff in a very obvious way most of the time and the plumbing will take care of itself. Do I have another one? Um, so just another little stage. Um, I'll run this. So what I did here is print out the religion of every member of Congress. Um, that's a lot of data. So I'm going to go into our stages here. Um, this pull value you can see is just a map to pull the religion out of that person object. Um, and I'm just going to replace this with this unique stage I created, which is just unique plus run until exhausted. Then I'll run that, and now we get just the unique religions in Congress. So unique um, is just another one of those convenience things. Unique hash, or unique <coughs> cache uh, group is in there. There are a lot of little things that you could do with a map stage or sometimes with a select stage, but um, things that, that are pretty obvious. Um, that you're going to do a lot if you're using this. So I think, yeah, that is pretty much the end. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't have awesome slides because only now I realize how incomprehensible that whole thing was. Can you, oh, sorry. But, can no. You, can you show us how you defined the pipe operator and then you injected that in? And sure. Although that code is pretty gnarly right now, but let's <laughs> take a look. I guess it is on GitHub, so it's not like I could go hide it. <laughs> so this is the stage base, and this is all based on, um, I need to give credit where credit's due here. So. But I'm not connected to the internet, so I can't. This is all based on a thing that some guy did, and it's, <laughs> <laughs> It's in the readme. Um, right, Dave. Yes, that guy. Dave Thomas. Dave, Dave Thomas. Dave Thomas. Thomas. Using, using, using fibers in Ruby 1.9. I cannot take credit for the implementation. Uh, Dave Thomas wrote Mark 1, and then we just added a whole bunch of stuff on top of it that he'd probably hate. Um, so let's go find our pipe operator. So pipe takes the stage. It takes the right-hand stage. Um, it tells the right-hand stage, hey, I am your left-hand stage now, and then it returns the right-hand stage. So when you are stitching together your pipeline, you know, it goes left to right and just adds everything as it goes and then returns the rightmost element. Um, this, that thing in there you see with root source is so that I can do things like wrap, where I'm creating a sub-pipeline. Um, and the reason that wrap is in there instead of just using restrict resume is you can layer wraps and restrictor zoom lets you do one thing and no more, and that didn't feel functional enough. So um, the Dave Thomas implementation, it's just other dot source equals self. But that's, that's how that works. So these things, 
when you set one of these up, um, you initialize it, it creates a new fiber, and the fiber just consists of process and dye. Um, we've seen the process stage, that's manages iteration. Um, the default process is um, just get an input and then pass it to handle value, and the default handle value is just output the value. So a default stage with nothing else is a no-op. Um, this die just outputs nil forever. Um, nil is our magic, hey, I'm done now value. I realize now that we probably should have used end of file or something, but nil works okay. Um, wow, we really should have used end of file. That would have been a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, the problem is there has to be one thing that you can always return and have it mean it's dead. Um, for us, nil worked well. Uh, so basically, you create this fiber delegate that runs process until process is finished, uh, and then just runs die forever. Um, and then you resume it, and then whenever it outputs, uh, it just yields the value that it has. So what you set up is a, a chain of fibers that, you know, this one will execute until it realizes it doesn't have any data, and the next one will do the same thing all the way up the chain until it gets some data and then it'll pass down, and it may branch off at multiple points. You know, we have some stages that get one value and emit exactly four values every time they're called. But I don't need to manage the details of that. I know whenever I call output that it's passing a value down the chain. Any other questions? We do. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very able to take criticism. Whatever no, you were going to say next is... I wasn't going to criticize. Well, now I'm just hurt. <laughs> <laughs> He's hurt that you didn't criticize it. It's, good. it's interesting. An interesting way to solve the problem. I don't and so the idea for us is we have um, lots of processes that are pretty close to being the same, so maybe three quarters of the pipelines are the same for each stage. And then it's, you know, instead of getting a whatever, I get a something else and it fits in the pipeline, it allows us to, uh, a nice way to have um, small bits of work that are easy to, to understand um, that then are able to, you, you know, it's like Lego, it's just punch them all together and it creates nice stuff for us. Yeah. And theoretically, with this structure, without making big changes to our individual stage code, we can do concurrency, we can distribute it. There's lots of things we could build on the structure that we don't really need or haven't gotten around to yet. Can I, can I show them top view, top seller? Sure. So if it you don't might know, make a little more sense. Yeah, I, I go digital. Um, we are a product recommendation company, and so um, we track user behavior and then try to guess what's the best product for you, so we recommend product. And so this is one of our our simple items, which is going to take, uh, it's going to look at all the views of all the users across the site and tell you which ones are the most viewed items. Yeah. So what we're talking about with reusing stages. This will calculate all the top views for a day. This will calculate all the top sellers for a day. But really, you know, it's emit whatever, and then they're exactly the same all the way down the rest of the chain. Um, for top views, top sellers, it's not a huge win. When you get into more complicated stuff, you know, these things are monsters, but it's lots of little reusable components. The only, only thing that throws me off is I'm just not a big fan of the pipe, just the syntax, essentially. Like, I would, I would really just see that stuff, each method on its own line, you know. Um, but I, I think it's cool. We, we, I think we used pipe because Dave Thomas used pipe. I think initially I wanted to use plus, and then I decided that was silly. Then you wanted to use Chevron. And I wanted to use Chevron for a while, and well, we went round and round, and finally we forget it. We'll just use pipe. Were there any other remotely similar implementations of Ruby as far as like stream processing stuff, and did you consider using any from other languages? Like you know, one of the big ones I've seen recently is Storm. You know, that does like much heavier weight, like topologies. And, the the problem with Storm is the the barrier to entry is I feel like it's a lot higher. 
uh, far as it, it to, to kind of understand what it's doing. I mean, really, you know, we're on Mongo. All the data is in Mongo. We can do everything that we're doing here in MapReduce. But trying to write and debug MapReduce, especially in an environment where um, the output is kind of difficult to test, um, it's, it's hard. Um, this lets us break down and test all the components. So um, I don't think we looked too in depth at some of the other pipeline things. Um, and, and are you getting but, good performance out of this? Like, yeah, it works well enough. The, the, big, the big problem with us is we're always memory bound. And so this, you know, our, our old process is, is very dumb. Um, and I can say that because I wrote it. It's just it, the way that it uses memory is just stupid. Um, we have processes that will consume 15 or 20 gigs of memory and then crash. Uh, to run the same pipeline, to run the same, you know, to create the same output, uh, this process is like a, 100 megs. So the, the, the memory footprint was a major driver for us to do it this way. And another reason why we probably rolled our own framework just so that we could control, we, we want to control where our pain was coming from because we know what we are and aren't able to tolerate. Um, if it turns out to be slow, but it's memory efficient, we can run five or six of these things in parallel. It's not a big deal. Um, we probably run, you know, hundreds of these pipelines every day. Yeah, probably closer to thousands. And it sounds like these are back end processes. Yep, yeah, yeah, it's like night, it's like batch stuff that occurs. Yeah, yeah. Sure. But it is. Um, I've got. I think this is the. No, that's not the one. One of these that actually reads every file in the directory that I can't seem to find right now. Like and it's parsing all of them. Um, yeah, so this one is gonna go through and output the votes for everything that has education in it. So we're talking about 1,200 XML files. It's loading the entire file into memory every time, looking everyone up. This isn't a scientific benchmark by any means, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> Most of the pain here is definitely the parsing. Um, we're kind of just heavily dependent on how good the fiber implementation is. And it seems pretty good. Did you tweet that Amazon had a thing that would have helped with this? Or that oh. was, was that another thing? So the like, day that I finished version one of the gym, Amazon announced a workflow system that is distributed this. Um, also, the next version of Mongo has the aggregation framework, which is about half of this. So. Um, but if you wait around because someone else is writing what you're writing, right. then you're never going to write anything. Well, really, you should. I feel like you should spin what what is happening as you won. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <really> <laughs> yeah, we beat Amazon. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm hearing. Now you don't have to pay per per uh, stage in your stage. Right. Yeah. You, you get to pay per <laughs> megabyte in your right. stage. <laughs> well, and. In thinking about how we would decompose these problems into Amazon workflow problems, the problem is our, our chunks are really tiny. Yeah. We like to pass between stages a lot because we want each work unit to be a very, very small piece of the entire puzzle so that we can decompose them, take them apart, put them back together in a little different way. Um, so it's you know, Amazon wants you to have each work unit take a while before it passes on to the next one. And we want each work unit to be microscopic. You want to read it pretty much. You know exactly what's going on from stage to stage. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we tried to get to where if you just read the pipeline, it will tell you what's happening. Yeah. Open source? Yeah. Yes. Even better. It's on the GitHub. <laughs> So you can yeah, it's on GitHub, so you can edit it all you want. You validate it in source, right? Yeah, the uh, Stages gem is uh, I go digital LLC Stages. Uh, it's on Ruby Gems too, so you can go find it through that. Um, and it's fairly stable now. I haven't pushed any breaking updates in weeks, um, <laughs> but it is. Uh, and then my code here is up on my GitHub at uh, Mediocrity slash Donkelfund. I have a serious question for you. Yeah, it's more of like it's not related to this specifically, but like uh, if you weren't using Mongo, if you were using 
some old fashioned database like PostgreSQL or something, would your problems be different? Like, would you even have written something like this? Or would you, I, I don't know, I don't even know what um, questions to ask so, based on so that. So we, we like, started, before we did Mongo, we were on MySQL. Um, with a bad SQL DBA and indexes in the wrong places, right. and then our data got too big and we couldn't add indexes anymore. Right. Um, and so we had different problems then. So right. uh, I, I would like what this does is allows you to do groups without, like, if you don't have an index and you can't query properly, then you could do things like this in a really large data set without the proper indexes. Good. Like the part of the reason we don't do these in. MapReduce or just as a query is because we only have certain indexes on our Mongo database as well, right? So I, I can't query on everything. So some of it is how do I use the indexes that I have to break up the data in a way that I need to then process it later on. Yeah, the, the, the big the, the problem there is we have the data set I'm working with right now, the client I work with today, um, the collection, just one of the collections I'm processing is 21 gigs. And the indexes are four, four gigs. So it's just, you know, at that point, if you can change that into a stream problem, like I can write that join in, in SQL. I'm just worried about the, the implications of that, especially on a production database. Now, if we were still in SQL, we'd have it sharded and memcached and, and all those things. But um, it, it definitely came up sooner because we're on Mongo. And because for us, getting getting this sort of data as a stream is a very natural operation in Mongo. Um, but hopefully, you know, hopefully someone finds a use for it outside of our specific problem. I I love it when people use our code. Cool. And if you really want to learn about fibers, um, just go delete a couple classes and try to rewrite them because <laughs> they're pretty cool. Didn't, were you arguing about that at the yes. bar a few months ago? Yes, and months the, ago. the result of that bar discussion is this gem. Right. Remember it getting kind of heated. Yeah. Cool. Also, so, speaking of the bar, assuming... When, when you put the video up, can you black out our production code? Sure. I'd appreciate it. I'd like to stay employed. <laughs> <laughs> can we leave the audio? Or? <laughs> Probably. What? Especially this part of the audio. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, this part's not so bad. <laughs>